Jose Osario. Brad Goodman, thank you. Uh, welcome to Doc Talk Live. Uh, I appreciate you. you doing this. Uh, I'm with Dr. Jose Osario, um, and he is a cardiologist. Right? An electrophysiologist, which is a cardiologist to specialize in heart rhythm problems. Heart rhythm problems. So, so you look, when people think of the heart, okay, and they think of heart disease, they think of the arteries, the coronary arteries. But really, what you work on is the electrical system of the heart. Is that, is that more accurate? That's very accurate. So if you think about the heart, it's, it's a piece of muscle, just like any other muscle in your body and it has the coronaries, the arteries that supply this muscle, which that's, if it ever gets clogged up, that's how you have a heart attack, that's where stents are used to treat that type of condition. If the muscle is weak, you have congestive heart failure, there's specialized doctors that take care of that as well. And then for the heart to know when it's time to contract, to know when it's time to beat, we have a specialized, we call it an electrical system that literally tells the heart, it's your own pacemaker, telling the heart every time, 60, 70, 100 times a minute when it's time to beat. So there's many conditions that can affect the electrical system. Today the most common is atrial fibrillation, and now there's specialized doctors like us uh, here at Grandview that are taking care of patients with heart rhythm problems only. So let's talk about that particular rhythm problem, atrial fibrillation. What causes it? Very good question. So atrial fibrillation, which today is thought to affect between three to five million Americans, so a very, very prevalent condition, one that specifically in the South is, is very prevalent. It's a condition that you can either have a genetic uh, predisposition to have it, and that will cause it, but most commonly it's caused by having high blood pressure for years, sometimes decades, being overweight, having sleep apnea, and other conditions as well, uh, such as you know, uh, as excessive alcohol use or smoking. So there's many things that are risk factors to lead to this condition. In the South, the more common in the whole U.S. would be being overweight and having uh, high blood pressure and sleep apnea. So there are treatable conditions that can uh, decrease your chances of having atrial fibrillation. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, if I think about atrial fibrillation, and this, I'm going back 25 years now, um, because while I do work with the electrical system in the body, in my specialty, I'm not a, a heart person, okay? But if I think about the way the body works, you have the atrium, which sort of gather the blood and, and gently squeeze it into the ventricle. And then you've got the ventricle that squeezes it out to the rest of the body. So instead of the atrium, let's say, squeezing it gently into the ventricle, the atrium is sort of fibrillating. It's not really pumping. Is that right? That's, that's accurate. So the blood, then, instead of getting squeezed down into the ventricle, just sort of by gravity or just, just through the whole flow system, just sort of works its way into the ventricle, which then gets squeezed out to the rest of the body, which which, now I'm gonna take this a step further. I think the real problem is, is not that it's doing this number, but because the blood is kind of pooling in there, it sort of clots up. And now these clots get pumped down to the ventricle or get pulled down, the, and then they get squeezed into the brain and it causes like a stroke or something like that. Is, is that really the danger of this fibrillating atrium? So it is, it is. I think anytime you're, I'm seeing a patient with atrial fibrillation, the most important thing is to have a discussion about stroke prevention. If you consider, just as you've, you've described here, patients with atrial fibrillation, the top chamber of the heart, what we call the atria, they're not contracting. So they're just simply quivering and going very fast and in turn making the ventricle go fast at all. So as well. So there's three things that the atrial fibrillation will cause. One, symptoms, patients are not pumping as much blood, you may it's estimated that you lose about 20% of the pumping uh, function of the heart because of that. So you can feel tired, you can have shortness of breath. Most patients is just really severe fatigue. The other problem will cause is if your heart is going too fast, not with a control rate for too long of a time, you can develop congestive heart failure, which is a weak heart. And now 
The most important aspect is that in the left atrium we have this little pouch called the appendage. And if you have atrial fibrillation, because it's not contracting, blood just gets there, it pulls there, and when blood is not moving, you have a risk of a clot forming. So patients with atrial fibrillation are at a least five times higher risk of stroke compared to the general population. The older you are, the more comorbidities you have, such as diabetes, hypertension, prior heart attacks, congestive heart failure, the more likely you, have, you are to have a stroke. So anytime we see someone with atrial fibrillation, our first job is to do an assessment of their risk of having a stroke, the risk of having bleeding from blood thinners, and then treat accordingly. That's so, so a lot of times these patients will be on blood thinners in order to prevent a clot, and thereby prevent the complications of the clot. But now I want to jump to the cool stuff, which is this high-tech way of you getting in there and looking at the electrical system. And I want you to tell us really now what it is that you do as an electrophysiologist for atrial fibrillation. Okay? So, Get technical now. So it was uh, found about 20 years ago that what triggers atrial fibrillation in the majority of patients are electrical signals coming from the pulmonary veins. So this is a 3D reconstruction. Of this is how we perform our procedures. We use specialized catheters and, and a, what we call a mapping system. Think about it as, as a GPS system with a catheter that is inside the heart. As we're moving, we're doing a 3D reconstruction of the heart. And this allows us to deliver the therapy. I will explain. So these are the pulmonary veins. We have four pulmonary veins. So in patients with atrial fibrillation, what we find is that these veins, for some reason, start firing electrical signals very quickly, triggering the episode of atrial fibrillation, where the atria starts quivering very fast. So years ago, uh, there was this idea, this notion of, well, if it's coming from the pulmonary veins, why can't we isolate the veins? And that's the procedure we do today. So using special catheters, what we do is deliver radio frequency energy. That's or, a heat, I take it. Exactly. There's okay. heat and there's also what we call cryo, cryo balloon where we could freeze around to create essentially a rim of scar tissue around the veins with the goal being, since the scar tissue, unlike normal tissue, doesn't conduct electricity, we're going to create a rim of uh, isolating, insulating tissue there. Now even if the veins are firing very quickly, those electrical signals do not get to the heart. So this is another, um, the same three. So you're, you're almost like creating, a, you're like choking the electrical signal That's from it. getting there. And we go point by point doing this line of what we call ablation. And now as you can imagine, if this becomes a organized rim of scar tissue, the electrical signals will not go from the vein into the heart. We are not ablating, this is a common question, an area that is a working area in the heart, so where you don't have a decreasing heart function, we are ablating an area that should not have electrical activity to isolate it, is what we're doing. So do these nerves grow back? Do you have to repeat the procedure? That's a good question. So uh, fortunately, technology is getting better. Our techniques for doing these procedures are getting better as well. When we have patients with early stages of atrial fibrillation, what we call proxismal atrial fibrillation, our success rate at Grandview now with a single procedure is about 87%. Five to 10% of our patients end up having a second procedure. This is a significant improvement from about 10 years ago when 40, 50, 60% of the patients were having uh, more than one ablation. Fortunately, as you go to later stages, which is an important discussion because that's why we want earlier identification of patients for this. When you go to later stages, then you're no longer talking about simply the veins causing problem. The patient could start having scar throughout the left atrium, the atrium gets enlarged, the entire heart gets enlarged, and for the patients like that, there's a lot more that we need to treat and the success rates are a lot lower. So what I'm hearing is, is now that we've got much better treatments for this problem, catching it earlier really makes a difference in terms of outcome. Significant difference. This has been looked at in many clinical trials. The earlier you treat someone with atrial fibrillation, when appropriate. 
with cath revelation, the better. So oftentimes we will do a trial of medications, we will coach the patients into getting the blood pressure under control, losing weight, having a sleep study to see if they have sleep apnea, and then if they continue to have absolute atrial fibrillation, this is considered, based on our guidelines, the preferred approach today. Lisa, are there any questions out there, or are we good? So, so we're good. So, um, I'm just curious, what other electrical conditions are quite common that you would see? There's a, one of the most common electrical rhythm problems, heart rhythm problems that we see is what we call premature ventricular contractions. What we call, some people will call skipped heartbeats. Those are very prevalent. Almost everybody will have them to a certain extent. The vast majority of patients, we don't need to do anything. It's just, to, you know, we reassure patients. In some patients, just lifestyle modification as well, such as sleeping better, looking at sleep apnea will improve it. When is a PVC or, or frequent PVCs considered pathologic or functionally problematic, I should say? So we have, there's two aspects of it. One is symptoms. Some patients will develop significant fatigue and just not feel good, have shortness of breath. At that point, we'll consider it pathologic. And also, in some patients, they have so many. If you have greater than 10,000 PVCs in a 24-hour period, then that can lead to congestive heart failure. So those patients, we really look a lot closer. So the workup, when we see someone with PVCs, is typically to start by doing a whole to monitor and within 24 hours, literally count exactly how many PVCs a patient is having, and based on that, direct someone. And, and what causes a PVC? don't know the majority of patients, right? We really don't know. We know that if you have other types of heart disease, you're more likely if you have high blood pressure with the thickened How about heart anxiety muscle, and stress? Those shouldn't quite cause it, but if you have it, they can definitely increase uh -huh. the burden, the what number about, you have. What about uh, like caffeine or various beverages, things like that? So both caffeine and alcohol I think it's very patient related. Caffeine, which is also true for atrial fibrillation, although large studies show that the, there's not a specific correlation, so we never tell our patients to stop caffeine altogether, but there are specific patients that very clearly they will drink caffeine, they go into atrial fibrillation, so obviously once you identify your triggers, you should stop it. The same is true for PVCs. Uh, going back to alcohol use, uh, PVCs in some patients, small amounts will not increase, but uh, large amounts of alcohol or even the day after patients have drink, uh, they will see a significant increase in, uh, in the, the burden of uh, PVCs. Sleep deprivation is specifically ideal in terms of PVCs, so not sleeping well, shift workers, uh, patients with sleep apnea that is not treated, will see that leading to a significant burden of PVCs. Okay. Now, how about bradycardia? Go ahead and feel my pulse. What, what am I at right now? <laughs> you have a heartbeat. It's, uh, it's <laughs> I have a heartbeat. And, and, uh, <laughs> what so, am I at? bradycardia, it's well, something. I'm like pretty, pretty bradycardic, right? Yes. Yeah. You're, you're staying in the 50s. <laughs> uh, but bradycardia is something that you should only be worried about if it's causing symptoms. If you feel good and you check your pulse and it's 40, 50 on the Apple Watch or other other device you may have, and you're able to exercise, you don't have shortness of breath, there's absolutely no need to be worried about it. The more fit you are, the more you're exercising, especially runners, um, the slower your heart beat should be, and that's actually considered a good, good sign. Now, if your heart is very low, and you're having symptoms, you're having fainting, uh, dizzy spells, shortness of breath, absolutely, that is one of the conditions we treat. Oftentimes, the only treatment is a pacemaker. After you've eliminated, for example, someone may be on a medication that's causing a slow heartbeat. Your thyroid may be problematic. So after you've eliminated things like that, pacemaker is really the only way to increase a patient's heartbeat. And then what, let's say something about blood pressure, high blood pressure and low blood pressure. Sometimes patients come in worried. They're on no medicines and they're worried about low blood pressure. You know, their blood pressure is very low, let's say 90 over 60, but they have no symptoms. So I would think that's a good thing. The, the lower your blood pressure is, the better, assuming you're not symptomatic. That's 
absolutely accurate. I think there's no need for anyone to, to be worried about this. Today we have a lot of patients that have their own devices at home and are frequently checking their blood pressure. We oftentimes see that's just leading to unnecessary anxiety, to be honest with you. Uh, if you have a blood pressure in the 90s, uh, low hundreds, and you feel good, you're able to exercise, there's no need to be worried about it. Okay? Now, I assume that your patients get to you really via referral because I would think that patients are either going to their primary or having some sort of symptoms, maybe go to the emergency room or go to, go to, go to a doc in the box, get an EKG find some sort of rhythm issue that's electrical. Is that, the, is that the route that folks find you? It is changing. It's rapidly changing. Uh, about 90% of the patients I see are patients with uh, atrial fibrillation and the vast majority have seen a primary care physician that referred to a cardiologist that hence referred to, to us. Uh, but with wearables, with Apple Watch, with uh, other forms of, uh, of uh, self-diagnosing. We're having a lot of patients just, just self-referring right now. I think this is, this is a national trend. You know, consumers and patients are becoming ever more educated. You can go online and learn about it, and you can have your Apple Watch you now diagnosing with a fib. Um, so we have a lot more self-referrals now. This is an important thing because the Apple Watch can make mistakes, right? You don't have perfect what we call sensitivity or specificity. So what that means is that, especially if you're a younger person, younger than 55, your Apple Watch could tell you that you're having atrial fibrillation and quite possibly could be wrong. So the initial approach is not to start treating someone, but to do a confirmatory test. But this is, I think, the more patients have Apple Watch, the more patients have other forms of Do you of use an Apple more. Watch or do you do anything with those gadgets personally? I don't. <laughs> I have several patients and, and I, I definitely encourage patients, especially those that already have atrial fibrillation, I think as means of um, helping to treat them, help uh, not sometimes to alleviate their concerns, their anxiety, but also patients that we have, for example, on procedures, to use wearables as means to follow up, uh, to see how they're doing, to see if they're having recurrences. It can be very, very helpful. So if folks are catching this on a rebroadcast, I'm going to encourage them, you know, to type in their questions. Hopefully I can answer them, but I might have to forward them to you. Um, but I appreciate you doing this. I think, is there is there anything, any burning issues out there? Very good. All right. Well, I want to thank Dr. Jose Osario. So help me with the name. Say it for me. Jose Osario. So you're pretty I'm close. Pretty close. So and, uh, and I'm at Grandview. I'm in the electrophysiology lab at Grandview Hospital. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you.